Welcome to the Heal Podcast. I'm Kelly Noonan Gores, and every week I speak to the leading doctors, healers, spiritual teachers, and scientists to find out what is truly possible when it comes to healing. I also interview real people with extraordinary healing stories. My philosophy is what's possible for one is possible for all. Hey, everyone, and welcome to the Heal Podcast. Today, I am so honored to have a wonderful guest, um, Dr. Edith Eager, Edie. A native of Hungary, Edith uh, Eager was just a teenager in 1944 when she experienced one of the worst evils the human race has ever known. As a Jew living in Nazi-occupied Eastern Europe, she and her family were sent to Auschwitz, the heinous death camp. Her parents were sent to the gas chambers, but Edith's bravery kept her and her sister alive. After the war, Edith moved to Czechoslovakia, where she met the man she would marry. In 1949, they moved to the United States. In 1969, she received her degree in psychology from the University of Texas, El Paso. She then pursued her doctoral internship at the William Beaumont Army Medical Center at Fort Bliss, Texas. Dr. Eager is a prolific author and a member of several professional associations. She had a clinical practice in La Jolla, California, and holds a faculty appointment at the University of California, San Diego. She's appeared on numerous television programs, including CNN and The Oprah Winfrey Show, and was the primary subject of a Holocaust documentary that appeared on Dutch national television. She's frequently invited to speaking engagements throughout the United States and abroad. And I'd love to talk to her today about her book, The Gift, 12 Lessons to Save Your Life, because I truly believe it applies to everybody's life. And her story is so remarkable. So thank you guys so much for coming. She's joined by her grandson, Jordan, who will help out today. Thank you. So I would love to start, um, Edie, by just having the audience hear from your voice, just the Reader's Digest version of your experience that led you to the work that you do today. Just a quick, um, so take us back to the experience, and then we'll we'll talk about this wonderful book and all the lessons that you've learned. You look at life as one day, that morning sunshine may not come back. But at my age, uh, people ask me, how do you want to be remembered? Um, so I'm at the evening part of life now. And I like to be remembered as someone who's been through hell and was able to use that experience to make the suffering and be stronger as a result. So suffering to me uh, brought me where I am now. I'm Dr. Edith Eva Eager. I went back to school and I was about 40 something when my supervisor asked me, um, how will I get my doctorate? And I told him by the time I get my doctorate, I'll be 50. And he said, you'll be 50 anyway. And so today I like to tell people, go back to school and more doors are going to open up for you and you will become my colleague. So I am very happy to be interviewed by you. And I hope I'm not smart. I hope to be wise. Well, you are more than wise. And thank you for sharing your story in The Choice, which is another best-selling book that you wrote. Um, it's the memoir. It gives, goes into detail of what you experienced. Um, and really, I love that you just told that story about, I'll be 50 anyway. You'll be 50 anyway, because it's true. So many people get stuck and paralyzed by the fear of, you know, or 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 the regret and holding on to the past. Mm -hmm. And you're such a beautiful example of continuing to move forward um, and tapping into those gifts and, and using crisis and you know suffering and trauma um to wake you up to your your potential yes it's you know not what happens it's what we do with it and i think suffering makes you stronger and i like to let people know that there are many situations that you're totally unprepared for and you 
are told one thing and then you found another. So, you know, it's, it's very hard to remember that maybe your father told you he's going to take you to the movies next Wednesday and you are getting ready and you want to go to that movie with father. And then father said, you understand, don't you? Uh, father is busy that day. And, and so you may be disappointed, but you never get discouraged. You know, some people ask for things and you give it to them and then you want something and they're not there. Um, it's okay to live your life when you are looking at it from the inside out rather than waiting for someone to make you happy and so on. So I think really good for you to be appreciated for what you do. I think you're saving lives and I congratulate you for that. Oh my gosh, thank you. I mean, I look at your story and anytime I'm having a pity party in life, <laughs> there's just right. nothing compares to the horrors and the hell that you lived through. If she and can do it, I can do it. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. If, if Dr. Edith, can, if Edie can do it, you know, you've given us the shining light of example. If you can overcome and learn to forgive and su just survive what you went through, um, you know, we can survive anything. I believe that. And on the other, on the other hand, <clears throat> I like to mention that my friend, um, it's in my books, uh, told me that we're going to be liberated by Christmas. And Christmas came and went and she died the next day. Yeah. So you have to be more flexible than rigid. Uh -huh. Exactly. In your book, The, the Gift, 12 Lessons to Save Your Life, you talk about the prison um, of victimhood, the prison of avoidance, the prism of rigidity, which is what you're referring to now. And it's your mind. Yeah. And, and with your friend, and this is such a, you know, we talk about this all the time in the healing world. A doctor's language is so powerful. So, you know, and our mutual friend Deepak Chopra says, get the diagnosis, get the best medical advice that you can get, find out what's going on, but don't buy into someone's prognosis and, and let them take, rob you of your hope. And just like in the book, and you just mentioned your friend, she held on hope until Christmas. And then when that, that expectation, that liberation didn't come, she died along with her hope. So hope is so important to this journey of overcoming. It's better to be flexible than being rigid. Um, we were on a podcast together and she talked about whether or not uh, he said, well, you must have really fought to get through Auschwitz to be a fighter. And uh, what we realized is that Edie wasn't fighting her way through Auschwitz. She was dancing. And it's the dancing that saved her. The right. fighters didn't live. The, the, those that could flow, those that could be flexible and dance and move, that was the best survival instinct. And right. And that's amazing. And her mom, your mother told you no one can take away from you what you've put in your mind. Yes. So dancing, you went inside your head and you, you know, you went to this other beautiful place and moved your body and stayed flexible um, you know, and I think later you even said that a, a, a person came up to you after one of your talks and said, why didn't you rebel? Why didn't you fight? But if you had, you wouldn't be here today to share your story. So that flexibility, that, that power of the mind and, and flexibility, you know, was life-saving. The fact is that life is more appreciated and you don't even, even know until you lose uh, a part of it when you are locked in a prison. That's when you really begin to wonder uh, what kind of a, a life uh, hopefully is waiting for you and even use the time to write a book. Mm -hmm. That's what people told me, write a book, write a book. So that's how the choice came about. Yes, beautiful. And um, you you 
talk about um you can't you can't this was I mean there's so many poignant parts of your book and you have this brilliant ability to have these like one-liners so we'll we'll hit on some of those um but like for instance the opposite of depression is expression you know you talk about key, the 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 prison of secrets and until you realized all of the feelings you weren't allowing yourself to be to feel because the trauma was so horrific and you were just sitting on all these feelings and didn't want to, you know, dump them on your children or, you know, you just didn't think that you could survive experiencing all those feelings again, which is what we do. So at what point, what, what, what made you wake up to the fact that, oh my gosh, I need these, I need, I need to feel, I need to feel to process, to heal from the trauma so that I can move forward. I think the word permission might be good for people to give themselves permission to be human. Because if you're a perfectionist, you're going to procrastinate. You're gonna think about it tomorrow and then tomorrow doesn't come. And so I think it's important to think about your thinking and what you focus on. What you focus on, hoping, hoping to be in alignment to get you closer to a goal, have, have an arrow, that's a good word, have an arrow that you follow. Yes, I love that. Um, uh, Kelly, uh, you you were speaking about, we were talking about this podcast um, over at the, her breakfast table over there, which is where the, the best conversations with Edie happened, that, that and right here in her living room. Um, we were talking about heal, healing, and um, the quote that you said, you, you, um, what you, what stays in your body makes you ill, but what comes out, um, won't make you ill. And so when we had a conversation a while ago and I said, Edie, when you were keeping the Holocaust in, when you were not making that story, uh, public to even your family or, or those around you, how, how did you have illness? And um, she said something which I had never known before, but she she told me that she had had migraines all through her life. She had had migraines after the Holocaust, horrible migraines, um, stuck in bed, windows closed, dark, you know, uh, and, and I asked my mom about it. She said, oh, yeah, yeah, she used to have these horrible migraines. And when you went back to Auschwitz and you... You revisit the places where you've been. You relive the experience, and then you revise your life. You see? You don't get stuck in there. You go through. Yeah, the only way is to... The shadow of that. You go through it. Mm -hmm. So you go, you don't get stuck in it. And during that process, her migraines went away? Hasn't had one in 20 years. Wow, that's amazing. So an interesting fact about how we can create illness within our own bodies by the life and choices that we make in our minds. Totally. And I think this concept of you need to feel, this is what you say in your book as well, you need to feel in order to heal. And just like, you know, the opposite of depression is expression. We're so often, because of the way we are conditioned, to um, we get in the habit of denying our feelings because that's just how we keep parenting our children. And and if we're in the habit of denying our feelings and pushing them down or not expressing them because we feel like we need to be a certain way in order to be loved and accepted, um, we start to not be able to identify what we're even feeling. And I feel like I'm a pretty healthy, conscious person, but sometimes when I'm triggered, I'm like, I, I don't even know what this is that I'm feeling. So talk to us a little bit about um, that. like. How do we how do we come back in touch after you know forty years of life and and just being how do we come back to be able to to know what we're feeling and be in touch with ourselves and be okay with expression? Uh, you may say a couple of words um, that I use when I want to talk to a man. He mostly wants to understand everything. God forbid that he would feel the feelings. He may talk about the feeling, but doesn't feel the feeling. 
So it takes permission for you to feel the feelings. So on the two, two words that I use, sounds like. And then doesn't matter which feeling word because they correct you. I say, sounds like you said about it. Oh, no, well, mad as hell. Uh, uh, they correct you right away. Uh, but sounds like comes and they use it. And uh, I use it all the time. Sounds like you're happy about it. Sounds like. And all I have to do is throw in a feeling where it doesn't matter which one. That's correct. genius. And then, and then they want to correct you, and but then they get in touch with how they're feeling. I love that. Does it work for asking for directions too? Do you say sounds like you don't want to ask for directions? No, I'm kidding. <laughs> it's funny. Um, I got it. <laughs> thank you. Um, so uh, you say love. I want you to expand on this because I, 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 I want to learn more. You said love is a four letter word. T-I-M-E. Can you expand on that a little bit? Time. Time, <clears throat> time with myself, time with others, and structuring your time is extremely important. I, when I work, I work. I don't think about what I'm going to do an hour from now. I am in the present. So I live in the present, and I think young but not young and foolish. <laughs> Genius. You have to be wise, I think, at my age, especially when you're out on a date and he, he wants to know numbers. Uh, so I remember telling someone that I was married twice and his answer was, you killed two men. <laughs> I asked him to take me home. <laughs> yeah. <And that's laughs> that was the last thing I ever expected anyone to say. Things not to say on the date. Yeah, that exactly. That guy watches way too much Dateline. Yeah. Um, Ke Kelly, sorry, just to go back. You asked um, about love and time. And one of the things that Edie says is that love isn't what you feel. It's what you do. And... So I think for all of us in serious relationships, we know that feeling the feelings is really important, but doing the thing is the real action of love. And the way that love is uh, shown is in the time that you put into that love. And so, so often we're like, well, I love you. I love you. I feel so in love with you. But but that doesn't actually show what love is. Love is I did this for you. I spent this time with you. I I I went out of my way to do something very unique for you that mm -hmm. took time. So I think a lot of what Edie's talking about is how you use allocate your time reveals your love, not just the way that you feel privately. Totally agree. Yes, action is a language, pay attention to people's actions. Um, I Actually, that was to talk about your marriage twice. It was to the same man, correct? Or you got well, married? That, that would be three times if okay. we had it heard. <laughs> okay. Well, I love that story because so many people, um, you know, project, you, you have a whole, you have multiple chapters about this, but, you know, relationships mirror back to us the parts, the unhealed parts of ourselves, correct? And a lot of people um, are miserable in relationships or, or projecting or blaming their partner. But really, you say in the book, you know, I was very frustrated with the way my husband was behaving and I was feeling suffocated in my marriage. But what I realized is that my suffocation came from me stuffing down all the feelings, my unresolved grief and all the feelings that I had not processed from my trauma. Can you talk about that a little? What comes out of your body doesn't make you ill. What stays in there does. But in America, you use words like control yourself. You know, we want people to control themselves. 
No, I think it's good to go down to the ocean and start screaming. Because, uh, get it out, get it out, scream it out. Um, you just get it out of your body. Your body is very tender and I hope you take good care of your body. Be a good parent to you. Yes, exactly. Yeah, that's that was one of the things I loved. You have these chapters of how to break free of these, these different prisons, um, one of them being the prison of unforgiveness. And you say there's no forgiveness without rage. Yeah. And you actually encourage people to, to get the rage out of their body by, by going to the river and screaming or beating up the pillow. Yeah, you got to go through the valley of the shadow of that. Absolutely. Absolutely nothing wrong with uh, you finding uh, the Mother Teresa in you or the, you know, whatever the opposite is that. I think it's very important for you to be careful, to really love yourself because you are always doing something for everyone in the world. So are you a good mommy to you? Yes, I'm. Well, I'm in this phase where I've it started this year where I'm really putting myself first. I've realized the level of self abandonment that I've been doing and woke up to that because I was completely depleted, okay. and um, and I realized the answer was coming back to myself and loving myself. And I love that you talk about you know, being selfish or being self, self-loving is not narcissistic. It's actually crucial to the foundation of health, wholeness, and joy. So I have, I am now loving myself and, you know, it's not becoming a new me. It's becoming the real me. Like you talk about in the book, it's very validating. To yourself. Me. You know, you're someone's daughter, someone's wife, someone's friend, but who is the true self? Who is the you, and uh, that's why it's good to take time out to talk to yourself and listen what your body is telling you. The body never lies. Exactly. And you talk about, and this is so, I mean, I, I recommend everybody get this book because it's you know broken down into 12 prisons that we make in our own mind and how to break free of them and, and bring so much self-awareness. But you talk about one of our first real fears is the fear of abandonment. So we we start to figure out how to get the A's, approval, acceptance, you know, affection. Don't put your, don't put your baby in bed to take a nap and you go shopping because the baby wakes up and you're not there. And that is a terrible fear of abandonment that can happen. I keep telling mothers, don't sneak out and try to <laughs> do anything like that. I love it. Yeah, but as we carry this, you know, from these little abandonments that happen, you know, either little or, or massive, you experienced a massive one um, in our lives, we carry this belief forward that in, unless we, you know, we need to do something like the, we, we weren't enough or they wouldn't have gone shopping during our nap. Um, so, you know, going be, waking up in our adult life and saying loving and embracing and accepting all of ourselves rather than having to do um in order for someone not to abandon us no i love you just because you are you not what you do for me um i think it's very important to say that sometimes your parents tell you that if you think of yourself, you're selfish. And so if you want to really forgive your parents sometimes because they didn't go to that school that will give them permission to look at themselves and be good parents to themselves. And, uh, and you keep giving and giving and giving. And I did that when I came to America. I put food on my little girl's plate. My husband was raised in a in a very wealthy home. And so I wouldn't eat and I would give him food. I wouldn't do that today. It would be one for you and one for me. 
But at that time, I thought that I am supposed to, I hate that word, supposed to be the one who pleases the man mm -hmm. and he is number one. And that's not the case at all. Couples are much better now, the younger couples. They equally go to work. In the morning, they come home, they do the dishes together. Watch, you know, it, we can learn a lot from the young married people. Well, we, with your, with our, your help, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, I've learned so much just within my own relationship now um, and your stories in, in the book. Um, but I love, you know, it's there's I, there's so much turmoil in today's world it's and and every period of history right I mean, we have our perspective but it was probably way worse in world war ii and, and you know so but there's this polarization and there's so much hate and vitriol and um othering and i'm just you know and cancel culture right you're afraid to even be your authentic self for fear of getting canceled and you know, careers ruined and, and livelihoods destroyed. Um, and you talk so much about forgiveness and acceptance and you, you know, at what point, like the guy, the, the hurt people hurt people, abusers were abused. We are all victims of victims. So how far back do you want to go? You say that in your yeah. book. Yeah. We don't have to be victims of victims. We can change. I think that what you're doing, you're allowing people to give themselves permission to, to change and to be born again free, free from the should and the ought and the have tos. And what we do have to do is breathe. We need air, that we need. I think it's very important for you to be realistic but not idealistic mm -hmm. yeah we will make mistakes just because we're human um we're not perfect i'm not certainly i think that if i knew then what i know now i would have done things very differently mm -hmm. but now when i go back to hungary i uh, i know that my heart and soul is uh, Hungarian. I live in America, but I cannot tell you uh, anything about uh, hot dogs and hamburgers and the kind of things that Americans have on every Sunday. But I love to live in America because this is a country where people can empower each other with their differences. Mm. Yes, and that's back to this prison of rigidity you know, would you, you say, would you rather be happy or right? Yes. And, and one you of my need to be right. Yes. One of my favorite stories, um, and it's, it's a tough one to kind of repeat and talk about, but you were working with, a, I think a 12 year old boy who came in and he was just yelling about, you know, getting America white again. He was very, he was a bigot. He was very, you know, wanted to just, you know, basically a Nazi. And you, of course, your blood is boiling hearing these words, but you're looking at this innocent 12 year old boy and you talk about how, of you know, he was abandoned by his parents, his childhood trauma. Of course, he went to seek acceptance and, a, and attention and affection from a group. And that group happened to be white supremacist group. So at what point is this innocent boy who just followed his path and needs, you know, human needs for affection and attention and care and he just ended up in this wrong you know kind of narrative so rather like rather than fight back resist you leaned in and you said tell me more and just that shift rather than fighting and proving that he's thinking down the wrong path just your openness you know you don't know what happened to this boy uh but just that openness and acceptance is earth, you know, profound. You don't know how that affects someone. That's all they're seeking. He certainly didn't discover in that meeting that he hated Jews. Yeah. You know, he was given more acceptance, probably. He was going to kill all the Jews. He got up and he told me, the first thing I'm going to do 
is kill all the Jews. But then well, he was given love by a Jew, the irony. And I say, tell me more. Yeah. And, um, you can switch and you can take the road that you would like to have him or her experience. Mm -hmm. There is no hate worse than one woman against the other woman. You know, there is a lot of jealousy going on. And uh, I think it's time for everyone to write a book. I think it really is very helpful because it comes from you and it may become a bestseller, but that's not why you're doing it. You know, if you want to give a gift to your family, your children, your children. Yeah. Seven great grandsons. Wow. They call me Gigi. Gigi stands for great grandma. Wow. Oh, I'm that's a, a Gigi baby. Yeah. <laughs> Gigi they call me baby grandma. because I'm short. They're very short too. It doesn't matter. <laughs> but I'm still a Gigi baby. Wow. Ah. Well, what, what lucky boys they are to have you as their Gigi. I am very lucky to have those little ones. They are chasing each other. The twins are wonderful, precious three-year-olds. So I'm very happy this is to it. have three children, five grandchildren. Wow. Yeah. Gorgeous. Her, with, a, with, a, with a bevy of grand, uh, grand boys. Wow. Well, what a legacy to have. And, and you know, you do, you talk about this in your book. Of, of course, you had a lot of survivor's guilt because so few people and such horrific murders happened in Auschwitz. And then you survived magically and barely. And you held that guilt of survival and, and lost your parents. But rather than let that guilt slowly kill you over time, you said, let's honor the dead by living our fullest, freest life. We're still here. Life is such a gift. I went back to Auschwitz. And on the way out, I saw someone with a uniform. And I thought I was back in the camp. But I had a blue American passport in my pocket. Nothing made me feel more than then that I'm not there anymore. I've been there. i done that. I learned a great deal how to not give in and give up ever because the only one you have for life is you. All of the relationships will end. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. And you also talk about... And this is, I'm just, the, the the prison of judgment is such a big one, right? And yeah. you, you realize at a certain point that the Nazis, the guards um, doing atrocious things, they were more imprisoned in their minds and hearts than you were in the camp. Well, you couldn't change what was outside of you. And that's when the word attitude comes in. I, I kept talking to myself that it is temporary and I will survive it. Tomorrow became a big word. I will see my boyfriend tomorrow because he told me I have beautiful eyes and beautiful hands. So I ask everyone, tell me about my hands, tell me about my eyes. And, uh, and I came home and I looked for my boyfriend and I was told that he died a day before liberation. Oh my gosh. So I was never, I never I was wondering about that. I was yeah, like, we, we gotta were find gonna get married. We had our plans. We were gonna go to Palestine and fight the British. We, we had already worked out. That's so interesting you brought that up because I I literally would love your opinion. I just think your perspective is so pure and so backed by firsthand experience of what forgiveness and compassion and um and understanding and and you know tell me more curiosity and compassion can do so 
just in the high level, what do you feel is the solution? I know it's very complex and co complicated, but how do Israelis and Palestinians move beyond and, and learn to forgive each other and build something new? Well, men want to understand everything and women want to feel their feelings. I think it's good to do both, to get in your head, but don't forget your heart and give yourself permission to feel any feelings without the fear of being judged or judging yourself. You can feel sad or glad or mad, but how long you wanna hold on to it, it's up to you. Mm -hmm. I give that 30 second piece to uh, 5,000 Palestinians and 5,000 Israelis and then have them discuss it. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, exactly. I just, I'm just gonna send them all both of her books. Well, I don't know if they'll read the whole book. I think just that 30 seconds. Is just that, that 30 seconds. Yeah, because that way they, they can just put it like this. We like, it's like, a, <laughs> it's like a, there's like two lines of headphones. Yeah. And a conversation point. Um, right? Because that's the thing. It's like the ultimate, the reality is, is that both groups want to live happy, healthy lives. They're just holding on to such angst and aggression from their past that they can't let go of. Mm -hmm. And ultimately, it's that ability to forgive which will allow them both the freedom to ideally move into a place where they can, you know, share. Yeah, exactly. Harmoniously. Accept. Yeah, there's so much deep wounding in mm. each lineage, you know. Um, oh. That's my next book, hoping that we'll come out uh, from Auschwitz to La Jolla at the journey. <laughs> yeah. There, you're you're about to get some big waves down there. There's a uh, tropical storm slash hurricane coming our way. I know. We're excited about it. I'll be does, out there. Does Edie surf? Do you surf? <laughs> Edie does not surf. Edie, <laughs> what you don't see is out this window is Black's Beach, some of the most beautiful ocean whitewater views you can imagine. And Edie, have you ever been in the ocean? I have. Out here. I have not really. <laughs> I mean, in the in the in the Gulf, uh, in, in in Texas, you went. I I go to the water until it almost covers me. I'm a good swimmer. I was a good swimmer always. Yeah. Um, but I like my age because I can say anything, and uh, not to feel guilty because. I just say what is true for me. And uh, and the truth for me is that we're not born bad, we're born good. And we, we can choose always to create an atmosphere that people can feel any feelings without the fear of being judged. Yeah. That's it, I mean. I don't judge other people. They, they are who they are. There is a price for everything. And I think that it's wonderful that someone like you is so dedicated to bring people together so they can exchange philosophy. Yeah. I mean, yeah, judge, thank you. Judgment is a big one. And I think I'm just trying to heal all of my parts that are holding me back from a greatest potential and expression of myself, my real self and step back into authenticity and, and shed all of that weight of guilt and shame and these kind of beliefs that we got as child, as children. Um, and so it's just self-exploration. So having access to people like you who have done the utmost self-exploration um, is such a gift because as I go through it and learn it and apply it to myself, I just want to share with others because I get so much liberation in the process and it's layer by layer by layer. Um, and I just, as I feel that kind of expansion, I want to share that with whoever I can. My, uh, my, my daughter's husband got the Nobel prize in 2003 and I was in Stockholm and I did some research that most of the Nobel prize winners are firstborn 
or only children? Okay. Look at the statistics. Interesting. What does that mean from a psychological perspective? Not the middle children. The middle children are peacemakers. They want everybody to get along with everybody else. Mm. But the young people we call charming manipulators. Oh. <laughs> what if I'm the second child of two? Right. I'm, I'm the middle and the youngest. So there you go. Manipulative peacemaker. If there's two kids, you're the youngest. Yeah. So just a charming manipulator. Sorry. You don't okay. Care. Shoot. <laughs> I'm not the middle two. I was hoping I was a peacemaker. All right. All right. I see that. <laughs> um. So okay. Well. So if you say um, ignorance is the enemy of hope and the catalyst for hope. What is your final message for everybody out there today in, you know, that's looking around and kind of a dismal political, you know, horizon and, and other things, you know, societal structures kind of collapsing. And, and I just feel like we need, we need, we need to up level we're, 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 sh we're shifting and growing and it's a little messy at times. So what is your advice um, as we deal with a lot of ignorance and fear and hatred, um, how can that be a catalyst for hope? I, I suggest to be realistic, not idealistic, and look at the things that are around you and see how you can make it uh, an atmosphere for anyone who comes to you that you could exchange philosophies because I'm right, but I'm only right for me. I cannot be right for anyone else. Mm. So I think you give permission to people to feel any feelings without the fear of being judged. That is so profound. It's so true. You say in the book, you know, it, don't deny someone else's reality. Their reality is their reality. Just like that 12 year old boy who was saying he wanted to kill all Jews. And, um, you know, everybody has a reason, a story, a, a lineage that brought them to their philosophy. So like you said, that's so profound to be able to sit, be open, be curious with compassion for people and, and to, to arrive at the philosophy and the, the perspective that they have. Curiosity was really helpful to me in Auschwitz wanting to know what's going to happen next. Next is a good word. If a guy walks out on you, you just say next. I love that. You do your grieving, give yourself a couple of days. That's all. <laughs> this is Don't the best go into that head. grieving and grieving and feeling and crying. And, you know, learn yeah. from it. And you know what not to do next time. Yeah. And usually, and usually it's more about them than it is about you. So, yeah. I am the me that I will face as long as I live. So I don't want to lie to myself. I want to be as honest as I can. Um, helpful to others. And sometimes I think I could be more helpful to me as well. So you cannot just give, give, give unless you want for me, want for you, and uh, learn how to share. Balance, yes. Um, do you still dance? Do you still dance, Edie? I My boyfriend died, uh, fortunately, uh, and we danced every Sunday. Um, there is a 16-member jazz uh, musicians. We used to go every Sunday, but uh, I haven't been dancing. I love to dance. Mm. Um, the big band music is my kind of music. I love that. So sorry for your boyfriend, for your mm -hmm. loss. Um, all right, last last question for Jordan. What is your favorite Edie or Gigi story? Mm. Or 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 
one of her sayings. What what kind of is your beacon of of Edie? You know, I've I've spent a lot of time with Edie as a young man, um, and then uh, and she was my grandmother at that point. And now now we're together on a on a different journey, and um, one of the it's a journey that I feel is been put in front of me that is a road that must be taken because the power of Edie's work is changing the world and what I think her the pivotal piece of Edie's work and what is the most underlying uh, transformation that people have is the vision that what trauma they've suffered is not making them weaker. It can make them stronger. That to me is the epitome of her concept of the choice and that we can make a choice in our life about how we perceive our past events. And that shift of going from this thing which happened to me is the reason I'm not great to that thing which happened to me is the reason I am powerful. Because if I survive that, I can survive anything. And that transformation from being a victim to a survivor about one little thing in your past can transform your entire life. And that's that's why I'm on Team Edie. That's, that's the reason I'm here and not anywhere else and why my focus has been on this work because I see the power of it and I can say it and it's powerful when I say it but I didn't live it the way she lived it and so her testimony and the way that she carries forth this message gives it such credibility that nobody can deny it, the impact that it can have on their own life 100 percent if Edie can survive that yes, Thank you, you can survive anything. Thank you, Jordan. Mm -hmm. Oh my gosh. What an honor to have both of you on Edie. Thank you so much for your work. Thank you so much for sharing your story. Thank you so much for applying everything to your life on an like ongoing basis and accessing greater levels of freedom and sharing them with us because we all need your message more than ever. And um, I'm just so grateful that you, that you, Thank you. I want to call you an ambassador. You're an ambassador for peace, for goodwill. So I'm going to really honor you today as an ambassador for peace. And thank you very much for continuing your beautiful words and the way you respect everyone wherever they are and whatever they're doing without judgments. Thank you. Thank you for your non-judgmental love. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you so much for your time. And and um, yeah, I look forward to seeing you guys in person one day. I love you. Kelly, you. Can, I, can, you so I, can I quickly tell you a few things that are going on in the Ediverse? Please do. I'm sorry I didn't ask. Yes. Um, What's going on in Ediverse? So Edie's third book is coming. Uh, we're we're coming up with the title. We were working on it today. One of them is from Edie from home uh, from Auschwitz to La Jolla, or <laughs> Auschwitz to home. It may be, but it's a book. It's a it's a adaption of the choice for young adults, oh. and it is aimed at working with a teenage audience to go through the story of Edie's same period of time so her her high school years and what became her high school her her the school of auschwitz um wow. school of auschwitz oh there you go chills whoa that's yeah. pretty good actually pretty good. you know when auschwitz. i went to the university of texas they wanted to have all my papers and i never told them that i never finished high school and I did get my PhD. Wow. Dr. Eager. So don't let anything stop you. Uh, find a way to, uh, to go where you 
need to be and uh, take a risk. Ask for anything, it doesn't mean you're going to get it. But I think it's very good to be assertive, but not aggressive. Mm, yes. Uh, everybody get this book. And then I cannot wait for the next one. And what a gift. What a gift. Because, you know, it's it's hard enough being a teenager and adolescent. So much changes, so much changes in your body chemically in your mind and then you know you throw social media in and it's it's just it's we need this more than ever so i cannot wait i cannot wait to read this book likewise and share it yeah awesome when is that out uh they want it by the end of the year so we have our first uh, manuscript around november and then try to have it in bookshelves by the middle of next year awesome so the okay, goal is great. to get it into schools and really make it uh, make it one of those books that, that young adults read to educate themselves about what happened and also about what they can do in their own lives, yeah. what's happening and, to them. And to pull them out of victimhood and into survivorhood. Yeah. It, it, it's, you know, the things, all of these traumatic stories that we talk about, most of them are happening in your, in your adolescence. Mm -hmm. I mean, some of them happen further on, but so much of that happens in this time period. So what if you actually know while it's happening to you? okay, this is actually making me stronger rather than having to wait 20 years and, you know, therapist later to get to that point. Yeah. And, and, and learn how to process rather than stuff down and then relationship after relationship or addiction after addiction, you finally realize okay. you can't run anymore. You have to, you know, let it all up. So, wow. Yeah. That's amazing. I think it should be a part of the curriculum of every school across, Mate. across America. All right. Well, thank you so much for your time and um, you. touch. Talk to you soon. Okay. Thank you. Pleasure. Thank Bye -bye. you. Thank you for listening to the Heal Podcast. Be sure to tune in for more empowering wisdom and inspiring healing stories. Oh, and make sure you hit the follow button on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts so you don't miss that one episode that holds the answer you've been searching for. And if you feel inspired, we would love you to rate and review us so that we have the opportunity to reach more people. And of course, you can follow us on Instagram for some behind the scenes fun and more inspiration at at Heal Documentary and at Kelly Gore. Thank you so much and be well.